בלי הקדמות מיותרות, אני מבקשת להציג את פרופסור קנות סונדל, מהמכון לעבודה סוציאלית מבוססת ראיות בסטוקהולם, בשוודיה. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I've been uh, shortly about myself. I've been a, a full-time researcher for about 20 years, dealing primarily with, with child maltreatment and uh, juvenile delinquency. But since some years ago, uh, three, four years ago, I'm working at the National Board of Health and Welfare in Sweden with the primary task of uh, implementing evidence-based support <coughs> treatments in the social welfare system. Uh, and about that I could talk very long. But now we'll talk about a study uh, which we conducted some years ago about uh, family group conferencing and I will then at the end come to a very uh, important and interesting question and that is the transferability of interventions across nations and countries and contexts. Is it possible to uh, replicate the results that are often developed found in North America, in, for instance, Scandinavia, Israel, or elsewhere? That's a huge question. Okay, family group conference, uh, a short uh, replication of what it means. First of all, it was developed in uh, New Zealand with the uh, indigenous Maori families. The uh, Maoris were heavily uh, overrepresented in the social welfare system. Uh, and I think Unfortunately, they still are. Note also that family group conferencing in North America is called family group decision making, but it's the same thing. Uh, in the late 80s, then the New Zealand started with this, and uh, later Australia, United Kingdom, and you can see USA, Canada, Norway, Sweden, and Israel, at least at some time, has uh, implemented this uh, intervention, this treatment. Uh, the basic premise is then, well first of all, it's a legal question that families should have the right to be involved in their own kids. And in this case we're talking about the extended family, not, not just the parents, but also the grandparents, their relatives, etc. Et uh, the Another basic idea is then that the solutions found within the family would be more effective and stable as compared to those that are imposed by the professionals. Because families are more motivated to make a change. And uh, sensitive information, which perhaps the family don't want to uh, share with professionals, can be used in this decision making. And we had a beautiful example of this in our study from Sweden, and that was that according to the social workers, they didn't have a clue that some of the families, some of the parents had substance abuse problems. But this information was then found in the uh, solutions that the families suggested for their uh, problems. And it's also believed that uh, FGC's family group conferences will initiate better family functioning since they restore families that perhaps have become separated through time. They bring them together and they also restore the uh, legitimate parental authority. These are some basic premises. And the version of um, uh, uh, family group conferences then that we have in Sweden, and there are small variations of this throughout different countries, is first of all that it's the uh, child protection services, it's the professionals that decide if the family actually should have a family group conference, that is, they decide if there are problems enough for the society to intervene. But it's the family that suggests the support. The second is that the extended family includes not, as I mentioned, just the uh, biological parents, but the extended family that is kin, friends, neighbors, etc. And uh, the extended family is to meet in private without professionals there uh, so that they can be fully, freely to, in, to put all the uh, information they don't want to share with the professionals into the decision making. And this protection plan that they then hopefully can uh, bring together, this is to be accepted by the child protection services 
without changes, as long as it doesn't threaten the life of the kids. Okay. Uh, well, then, this, this in the late 80s, then, this was, uh, let's say, invented or reinvented in New Zealand. And uh, when it came to Sweden in 95, at that point, and still is, there were almost no research, at least no, more, no research that compared family group conferencing with other alternatives. Few follow-up studies, but mostly it was just one study where they asked the parents about or the, the, those that participated in the meeting, meetings if it was good or not, and uh, sell them in a compassion group. And this is uh, quite important, according to me and others, if you want to have a picture of the effects of a treatment. Because uh, in a normal situation, if you look on a group of people over time, clients from social work practice. If you look on, on them over time, on the average it's almost always get better. On the average it's almost better over time. But the interesting for us, at least researchers, is not if it gets better, but how large part of this change is attributable to the intervention, to the treatment. That's the point, yeah? And uh, samples were also furthermore unrepresentative. So the Swedish study started in 95, we continued for three, four years, uh, and it involved 10 local authorities throughout Sweden. Uh, it was chosen, and uh, all the family group conferences that took part in those 10 local authorities were included in study, and altogether 97 children. Then. And those were compared to a random sample of normally occurring uh, investigations that didn't become family group conferences. So we had a random sample of normally occurring interventions as a compassion. And we called that treatment as usual. And they were 142 children. We had several quantitative and qualitative measures and we had a follow-up time of exactly three, six months, three years, exactly three years follow-up for each child from the family group conferences to part until three years follow up. So we have quite a long follow up time for this area, for this uh, social work. So uh, some of the immediate outcomes. First of all, we uh, or the family group conferences succeeded in bringing together uh, family members. Uh, the professionals did not take part in this private meeting. Uh, family spent two and a half hour or more in private time, which is by, uh, among the highest uh, in the literature on this area. So, so far everything looked very fine. And all families also succeeded in uh, agreeing on a plan of time to support that their family needed. And the plans, as I mentioned earlier, indicated that sensitive information was brought into the decision making. And all plans were accepted by the social workers. And when we asked the family members, they felt, on the average, quite empowered. So, so far you can say it was a huge success. The, the um, possibilities to have good results must be considered good. When it also comes to stopping the hypothesis, then decrease the risk for reader first because of future problems, non-neglect non and abuse, and that the extended family should take active part in for instance, reporting when problems continue to be. And in case of out of home placement, foster care, it should be with kin. And over time, because we know also that those kinds of problems often take long time to solve. So in the long run, it would increase the possibility of a closure. That was the hypothesis which we work with. And uh, first of all, uh, this is the number of new reports that were substantiated and that resulted in some kind of services after the first family group conferences. And you can see it's a quite linear increase over time. So after three years, it was 60% of the family group conferences, families, that the children were re-referred and had new services, which could be seen as a failure then. Yeah? could be interpreted as a failure. Now, do you consider this to be a high or a low figure? 
Yeah, but could you just look at it like that? It's hard to say. My point is, it's hard to judge if this is a good or bad result without a compassion group. Okay, so we had a compassion group and it looked like this. It looked like this. So it was actually worse than the side of this. But if we hadn't included this group, we hadn't had a clue to know. Okay? So it's okay. Uh, this is the number of kids that for each, each month had service provision. And you see it, it decreases for the first of the one and a half, year and a half, and it is quite stable. And uh, as you see, it's about half of the kids in the family group conference system, about 30% in the control group, in the treat as usual. And here it could be one kid uh, gets out of the service and then comes back in, so it's different for different months. And here we have the number of kids in uh, foster care, about 20% versus 10%. So not that good results, okay? Then we look on the uh, rate of uh, abuse and neglect during follow-up, and the red bars are the family group conferences, and you can see there are higher rates there. Uh, reports by the extended family, there are more, that's good, that's a good result more reports from the extended family. But still note that only 20% of, only one in five reports came from the extended family, which isn't that good. But even worse when it comes to the, the treatment as usual. And placement with kin, yes, definitely a better situation with family group conferencing. But still, as you see, it's also four or five was in foster care. Now, we found out that the family group conferences, families, uh, was a selection of more severe problems. And this is the same result as we found in other studies. For instance, Rick Barth here. Uh, so we had to somehow handle this change. And we did it with, uh, by control, statistically controlling for initial differences. And when we did this, a lot of the differences between the two groups disappeared. They disappeared. So, uh, family group conferences did only account for between 0 and 7% of the variation of the results, which is quite little. In most cases, it was no difference, big part. Uh, and in the worst case, it might be somewhat harmful, but only somewhat. It's not a big difference, it's not a big issue. But at least not, not a special one. And as I said, it's similar to other outcome studies. And uh, Aaron Shonsky is conducting a systematic review on this topic. And he, I don't know exactly when it will be published, but probably within a year or so. And as far as I know, the results are similar. So okay, why didn't this, uh, why didn't this uh, excellent theory succeed? Why? <laughs> Uh, well, there are, as always, competing explanations, or perhaps <coughs> parallel more uh, you know, on the same time. And this is the first one, that uh, FGC is primarily a model for selecting services. For instance, in this family, the parents need support in becoming better parents. They are not functioning well as parents. But they don't select effective treatment. And at this time, at least, 10, 15 years ago, there were very few uh, interventions, very few treatments that had any uh, scientific support of being effective. So if you have two groups, the one group, the social workers decide what is to come, and the other one, the family, and it's the same services that are similarly ineffective, then you can't expect to have a change. So this result could be a different if you did the study uh, today. Another explanation is that the families didn't become empowered in the long run. And we made some follow-up interviews with, with family members, and we have some examples. Almost half of the families, which wasn't a, a huge part which we interviewed, but of those who interviewed, about almost half said that 
the support that the extended family promised to deliver wasn't delivered. And this could be a problem for the Swedish society. It could perhaps work tremendously well, for instance, in New Zealand or in Israel or wherever, but in Sweden it doesn't seem to function very well. And the third uh, explanation is that, yeah, it, it, it isn't transportable to new context easily because there are important things that actually uh, is that what counts. Which brings us over to the um, second part, what makes treatments transferable from one context to another. Uh, and uh, here you can say that first of all, most uh, treatments are evaluated in North America. So if North America is transferable to the rest of the world, then perhaps the situation is bright. Mm. But now we are starting to receive examples where uh, methods do not transport well from one context to another. So let me give you two examples to start with. The first is uh, actually a Swedish developed intervention. It's in school based. You meet parents on the uh, ordinary parent meetings and you inform them primarily that parents shouldn't serve their kids alcohol. It should be a, a non-tolerant situation for alcohol use. Uh, and uh, there's a study, two and a half year follow-up, which uh, proved decreased drunkenness and decreased delinquency. The effects are not large, but they are systematic. So that seems to work well in Sweden. And you know, in Sweden, we have by tradition a very intolerant attitude towards alcohol and youth. Youth are not allowed to drink until they are 18 years of age. They are not allowed to purchase alcohol until they are 20 years of age. And we have, although a big, tremendous change has occurred during the last years, we have quite few uh, retail what you say, where you can buy the alcohol, and there are also not that many restaurants. Yeah. Now, this was <laughs> transported to the Netherlands. <laughs> it was tested in the Netherlands without effects. No effects in the Netherlands. So why the authors who did this study uh, ask themselves? And the, uh, the, one of their uh, interpretations is this, that in Holland, Holland you have the legal age of drinking is 16 years of age, we have 18 in Sweden. They have one of the worst, uh, <coughs> least restricted uh, nations in Europe when it comes to availability of alcohol. You can purchase alcohol everywhere and it's easy to get hold of it and, and uh, the attitude in the society is very liberal towards drinking. So the pos it's possible that this may be less effective to work through parents in such a society. The second example is uh, a treatment which is called multisystemic therapy, which uh, deals with delinquent youth, anti-social youth with antisocial behavior, and uh, it's actually one of the most evaluated uh, treatments in the world. I would say there are tons of RCTs, randomized control trials, and other types of studies. Uh, so you can, I guess you could say it's effective in the United States. Uh, this was just ordered to Sweden in 2004. I, uh, it was me who did the study, and uh, we compared it to treatment as usual in 27 local authorities throughout Sweden. So we compared those kids who had uh, MSD with uh, anything else with MSD. They could shoot whatever. And as you see, and it was a randomized control trial, by the way. And as you can see, the uh, the problem behavior, the antisocial behavior increased, and the social skills increased, and the family relations uh, increased in both groups. No difference, no significant difference between the two groups. They were equally good. So how does this come? Why is this? Uh, why does it seem that there are examples where you can't transport treatments from one context to another? Okay, here comes four explanations. The first one is that you have different populations. 
I mean, uh, one situation which we see is that when you have an effective intervention, an effective treatment, it's a tendency that you use as a social worker that you use to that you start to use this for other problem groups as it was designed for. And it's perhaps not effective then. The second is that the treatment uh, is less potent than in the original context. So when we brought MST to Sweden, perhaps it was that they didn't use it as they should. They, it was a program brief, they didn't use it as they should. Or perhaps it was a, a higher or lower case load which could also in, impact the actual effect. A third explanation is that treatment usually is more potent than the original context. That is the normal situation, what normally is offered. Uh, for instance, in Sweden, I would say, compared to uh, at least the United States, it's more frequent that families with troubled uh, kids get some kind of family service. Uh, and as Francis noted, there are a lot of effective family services out there. And let me give you an example which is uh, quite thought-provoking. This is uh, the Swedish study and, and the bars here are the rate of change. The higher bar, the more change from start to follow. Uh, MST in Sweden, as you can see, compared to Norway and compared to four studies in the United States are quite high. It's the same measure, I should say, it's a CDC measure here. So high bars, good results. And you can see that uh, Sweden, the MST in Sweden fares quite well compared to at least some of the studies in the United States. So it doesn't seem like that the reason why we didn't get a difference in Sweden was that they didn't use MST as they should, since we have such a large effect. But now, look on the treatment as usual, the traditional, traditional services. This is how it looks like. And here Sweden fares highest, Norway number two, and the United States quite bad. So it could be that we actually have quite good services in Sweden from the start, and we didn't perhaps need a new service imported from the United States. Uh, the last uh, explanation is that uh, about this social demographic context as a moderator. We could have things of, uh, for instance, low prevalence of illicit drug use, or low rate of poverty, uh, things that could moderate the effects of an intervention. Think about living in, in a ghetto in, in uh, the United States, for instance, where uh, all the families are consisting of children and mothers, uh, very few of the adult people which you see has a work. There's huge uh, alcohol consumption and drugs. Uh, there are a lot of crime going around. You have a lot of role models that are not positive. And perhaps the parents, the mother often then, that are living alone, she, she's so um, uh, filled up with the things of bringing money to the, and food to the tables that she's not a good mother because of that reason. And then we have the last one, culture dimensions are unsupported. So, first of all, the prevalence of problems. This is uh, cannabis use, lifetime, at least once. Girls, age 15, here we have Israel, on the far end of, of uh, very few. And for us, <laughs> And here, in a way, we have the United States. Uh, we can take the boys at the same time. It's, it's about the same. Israel, here we have Sweden, also very low, low end. And Greenland, Canada, Switzerland, UK, Spain, and US, we can place in the top. So, perhaps if you construct a program, if you develop an, an, a treatment, uh, and you start with this kind of prevalence of problems, well, it might not work for this kind of population. Uh, at the end, then, we have the cultural dimensions. And uh, Hofstede is an anthropologist from, from the Netherlands, and he has constructed a theory which seems to be quite influential. I can't say it's the best theory, but anyway, it's a theory, and it talks about four dimensions. 
The first is the power distance between members and how much those in the bottom accept to be in the bottom. The second is individualism and collectivism. In what extent do you, do you receive uh, support from the collective, from the extended family, whatever it is? And how much is it coming from other homes? And how much is it, are you supposed as an individual to make a difference? The third is about gender roles, which is not complicated. And the fourth is the degree of uncertainty avoidance. How much do you tolerate uncertainty and novelty? Some societies do it more, some less. Now, look on this uh, chart here. Here comes the, the, the Israel situation. In Israel, you have your equal. That's not the big difference between the high and low society. You are according to this Hofstede. This, yeah. Uh, you have, and this is empirically derived. I say there's a lot of uh, studies based, and they receive approximately the same sum. Anyway, in Israel, you are on the average when it comes to individualism and masculinity, but you are quite uncertainly avoidant. Now, let's look at some of the countries which you can compare. Take, take one extreme, Japan. Mm. Japan has a larger power distance, the same individualism, but much more masculinity and uncertainty avoidance. Another one is Sweden, where I come from. So we are very unmasculine. <laughs> not, not all of us. <laughs> but we tolerate novelty quite good and uh, a bit higher power distance. Now, the two countries which produce most uh, evidence-based interventions, these are UK, or at least United States, and you see they are quite different from Israel. So I wouldn't take for granted that importing a treatment from the United States designed for an average American citizen would work well in Israel. That, I would say, is an empirical question. So, my conclusion, my conclusion is uh, do control research in your own country to be sure that what you import actually functions. Because as you know, there are a good theory for a treatment is necessary, but it's not enough. We have too many examples of theoretically sound interventions, treatments, that even prove to be harmful. So do your own research. The second is, if you haven't got any outcome research in your own country, use international evidence, but be aware of the risk. And the last, if you haven't got any international evidence, use theoretically sound treatments, but be even more aware of the risk. And ending two pictures. <laughs> this is today's situation. And tomorrow's we don't want either. <laughs> Thank you.